I mean, honestly, what we see on television, sometimes we're, I don't know, almost misled or enticed to think that, you know, these guys get it right every time. But the fact of the matter is, everybody messes up. At some time or another, everybody messes up. And I say that on the authority of God's word where Jesus tells us that everybody has sinned. Everybody's fallen short of the glory of God, amen? We're in this together. And when we look at the scriptures, we also see three different times that I can take you to right now in New Testament where God says, I am holy and you be holy as I am holy. And I'm thinking, how? How? How can we do this without making wrong turns, without making bad decisions, without messing up, without, I mean, I've called it really nice things so far, without sinning? How do we do that? And the scripture that I've selected today is Matthew 13, and Jesus answers this question with a parable. And so it's about a garden. Now, every gardener knows that Planting seeds is the easy part. What's the hard part? Weeding. Thank you. It's a very important part of having a successful garden. You keep the weeds out of there so that the vegetables, so that the fruit can grow. And it's hard work, amen? Anybody here ever gardened before? Okay, and have any of you ever had to pull a weed? Okay, every hand that went up for the first went up the second. Now, as someone has said, and I quote, when weeding, the best way to make sure you are removing a weed and not a valuable plant is to pull on it. If it comes out of the ground easily, it is a valuable plant. <laughs> now, there's a corollary to that truth. To distinguish flowers from weeds, simply pull up everything, and what grows back is weeds. Yeah, absolutely. Ridding ourselves of sin in our lives this the weeds if you will that pop up um it's something that every christian struggles with and i have been doing this long enough to to have talked with christians that were new in the faith as well as, as christians who had been in the faith for 20 years and 40 years and 60 years and they all tell me that they struggle with this whole idea of pulling weeds, of taking sin out of their life. And another thing I figured out is that we as humans have a tendency to want to ignore the weeds in our life. We have a pretty keen um, sense of observation. We can see weeds in other people's life pretty easy, amen? Yeah, it's easy to see the sin in the other guy's life or the other gal's life, but Sometimes we tend to ignore or look around or make excuses for, you know, the weeds that pop up in our lives. Um, I stumbled across this musing by a gal named Barbara Johnson. I think she's the same one who wrote um, Splashes of Joy in the Cesspool of Life. But she's kind of like the Irma Bombeck of Christian uh, literature. And this is what she writes about excuses. I don't do windows because I love birds and I don't want one to run into a clean window and get hurt. I don't wax floors because I am terrified a guest will slip and get hurt and then I'll feel terrible, plus they may sue me. I don't disturb cobwebs because I want every creature to have a home of their own. I don't spring clean because I love all the seasons and don't want the others to get jealous. I don't put things away because my husband will never be able to find them again. And I don't do gourmet meals when I entertain because I don't want my guests to stress out over what to make me when they invite me over for dinner. And I don't iron because I choose to believe them when they say permanent press. But this is the one that caught my eye. I don't pull weeds in the garden because I don't want to get in God's way. He's an excellent designer and puts everything where he wants them to be for his purpose. Wow. I know she was trying to be funny, but isn't that the way we behave? A lot of times, ah, well, God made me that way. What? This is the same God who did create us, but also calls us to be holy as he is holy. And I doubt that anyone likes pulling weeds, and I know God doesn't, because very first story in Scripture 
You've got Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit, and now they are cursed. They have to leave the garden. And what's the, one of the main things that God tells the man, he goes, now when you go to garden, thistles will grow. And your job just got a lot harder, mister. Now, has anyone here ever had to pull a thistle? Yeah, good luck with that. You better wear gloves. And um, you got to have one of those like prong things that you stick down in there because if you even leave a little smidgen of that root, guess what's coming back? Mr. Thistle. Yeah, thistles are bad news. The worst of the weeds. Now, in today's lesson, Jesus is telling a parable Let's get right to it. And this is what Jesus said. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds amongst the wheat and then went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. And the owner's servants came to the master and said, sir, didn't you sow good good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? Well, an enemy did this, he replied. And the servants asked him, well, do you want us to go and pull the weeds up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at that time, I will tell the harvesters, first, collect the weeds, tie them into bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then Jesus left the crowd and went into the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Um, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. And Jesus said, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom, those who belong to Christ. Now the weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, the end of time, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of time, at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. Now, On its surface, there's just not much to be said about this parable, if you stay shallow about it, except, you know, make sure you're not a weed. I mean, that's what it seems to be saying, because what does it say? One of these days, the end of days will come, the end of time will come, and the weeds will be uprooted and thrown into the fiery furnace. Now, it says the weeds are all those who do evil. Oops. Think about it. That's a little disconcerting. Everyone, all who do evil? Where does God draw the line? Um, just murderers? Maybe rapists? I don't know. Adulterers? Thieves? Does fibbing on the tax return count? Um, where does God draw the line? I wonder if gossiping, especially if it like, you know, borders on you know, bearing false witness, I wonder if that makes the grade. What about not sins that you commit, but sins of omission, things that you don't do that God's called us to do? Where does God draw the line? What about those who ignore their neighbors when they're in need? What about those who are called to make disciples and never even try? What about that? How about those who only give a pittance to God after God's been generous with them? You know, where is the line drawn? Because could it be that Paul was right when he said in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned, all have done evil? All have fallen short of the glory of God? We know that on the authority of the word of God. That is true. We know it from the experience of our own lives, from watching others. So what is our hope then? How do we do this? Is it not the blood of Christ alone that makes for any hope in this scene? Now, I don't know about you, but a fiery furnace just doesn't appeal to me. 
And and if that day comes when God's beginning to pull, have his angels pull all the weeds, I don't want to be one of them. So having said that, and knowing that I don't want to depend on my own virtue, I've got to hasten to the only hope we've got and dig into this parable a little bit deeper. I think there's a few takeaway lessons that we can glean here to help us to live this life in a worthy manner as the way God called us to in an effort to somehow um, aspire to be holy even as he is holy. Why? Because it's a command. So let's see if we can figure this out. The first thing I want to say is when I, when I really just started thinking through this, um, this story what lessons might be takeaway? The first one is this. Pulling weeds is key. It is so important in the Christian life that you take time to pull weeds. If you want to be successful in your walk with the Lord, take time to let him show you the weeds. Take his power to pull them out, uproot them from your life, and let them die. There's an interesting report in the news some time back Um, It was about an event that was designed for college students, for um, college students that were enrolled in agricultural studies. And uh, the purpose was to get them to um, understand the etymology and the background and and how to identify weeds, okay? So one pundit called it the World Series of Weeds. Another called it the Hula Bowl of Herbicides because what they were asked to do was identify weeds at their youngest stages when they were first coming out of the ground and uh, identify them and then properly uh, discern how they could get rid of them, what herbicide they could use. I mean, these are advanced studies here. And agricultural students from the universities both in the United States and Canada competed in order to be able to identify weeds to um, prescribe the right herbicide, the right chemical that would uh, take that weed out without hurting the uh, vegetables that they wanted to preserve. Now I quote, this is uh, James Worthington, uh, Western Kentucky University. I quote, they need to be able to recognize weeds when they are tiny, he said, because when weeds get big enough that anybody can recognize them, it's too late to do anything about them. Now this guy is the president of the North Central Weed Science Society. How many of you knew that existed? Yeah, but I mean, he makes a pretty astute statement here. Once you get to where the weeds are big enough that anybody can recognize them, they're pretty far gone. It's already done some damage to the root structure of that which you want, the valuable plant you want to grow, that you want to bear fruit. I think it's a pretty important thing. When weeds get big enough that you can see them in my life, they're pretty well grown. Because how many of you know, we can hold it together for an hour on Sunday pretty good, amen? Yeah, I take a little break around 10 o'clock to talk to some people, and then I can do it again for another hour, and then I've got to rest all week just to get ready to do it again. But to be serious, how many parents have been too late in recognizing a weed growing in the life of their youth, their child? For that matter, how many of us as adults have recognized too late vices in our life, weeds that have begun to grow, that we've just allowed to grow. And I'm talking about difficult weeds to deal with, like bitterness, holding a grudge. How many of you tried to pull that weed out? That one's got a long root. You know, we don't talk about things like that in the church too much because we don't want to sound judgmental, but I'm telling you, I think we need to because we have to talk about those weeds that totally wreck human existence. They despoil our lives as people and as people of God. Lives are destroyed because of sin. Every day, hearts are broken because of sin. Relationships are torn apart because of sin. We need to talk about it. And and, and, here's the sad thing. The people whose lives are, are being choked by these weeds are, for the most part, good people. They're not bad but they're good people who weren't vigilant about pulling weeds when they were little. 
And now that they're full grown, they're being choked by it. You may have heard about the 61-year-old Massachusetts grandmother who decided she would take a job subbing um, for the local schools as a bus driver. And um, on her first day, she uh, took a few wrong turns. She got confused, made some poor decisions as to which roads to take, and she wound up in the state of Connecticut from Massachusetts. Now, because she had already picked up 10 kids on her route, they issued an all-points bulletin for charges of kidnapping, and because she had crossed the state line, the FBI was called in. And finally, after locating the lady and um, first um, trying to calm her down, she was all up a pieces, the police and FBI agents concluded that she had simply made some wrong turns, some poor decisions, and had lost her way, and they released her. Um, she did get written up at work, though. Now, a few wrong turns. Sound familiar? You've seen it before. Mayhaps you've experienced it before. It happens to good people. A bad judgment call, a series of wrong decisions, and suddenly you're lost, you're entangled, you're trapped in the weeds, if you will. And sometimes much is at stake. Sometimes it's a marriage that's on the line. Sometimes it's your health. Pulling weeds is key. It is an important part of who we are as Christians. Now, I want to hasten to remind you Christianity 101, this is the basics, this is the foundation. Never forget, the bottom line is this, Jesus is still our Savior, amen? He is our Savior. Wesley used to say, I was saved, I am saved, and I am being saved. Why? Because he knew it was a journey. He knew it was a process. He knew that he was gonna wake up tomorrow morning, he was gonna give the day to God, and he wouldn't go very many steps before he might make a bad decision, a wrong turn. And a weed would begin to grow. Now, you might think after reading this parable that God sounds almost eager to destroy, but saints, take it with the whole counsel of the word of God. Take this parable and apply everything that we know about the Lord. Because I want you to know, if you read this parable to say that God is just some vengeful judge, you've missed it. And you've missed an important truth. The fact is that the last thing that God wants to do is destroy us. Jesus said that he desired for all. All means all. That's all it means. Everyone. He desires everyone to come unto him. God makes us mindful, though, of the things that will keep us from that, those weeds that crop up. And he wants to deliver us from. And you and I are hearing this message this morning because he wants us to know, be mindful. Look for the weeds. Deal with them before it's too late because God has no desire to destroy. You're all familiar with the fact that in Scripture, God is very clear that he never created hell for people. It was created for the devil and his minions. But he's also very clear. Take care of the weed problem. Don't let them entangle you. Um, there's a guy walking through a park one day, and he saw this large oak tree, one of those massive oak trees where it would take probably two of them to just you know, make their fingers meet going around. Massive oak. But there was this vine that was growing beside that had begun encircling this tree. And over a period of just a couple of years, it had covered the tree so much with its vinery and all these like little hairy things that were coming off the vines that when you looked at the tree, you couldn't even see the bark. It was that bad. This little vine that at its base was only about two and a half, three inches around was killing this mighty oak. Now, there were gardeners in the park that recognized the danger. They took a saw, and about 30 seconds, they solved the problem. They cut that vine 
right at the base, clean through one cut, and all of that twisted and tangled vine around the tree, about a month later, all the leaves had wilted. All those little hairy things that were sticking out from the vine that were clinging to the tree began peeling off and falling away, and the tree was saved. And so I want you to hear this. Have hope. No matter what kind of a mess we make of our lives, Christ is always able to find the root of the problem and take care of it. He is. Saints, I am living proof that God can save even the worst of mess. No matter how bad you screw it up, God can come in and make it into something that's beautiful. He can. Jan will attest that he's not done with me yet, all right? But he's working on me. He never gives up. And I just want you to know that it's the same for you. All you have to do is submit to the pruning. Submit to those weeds being pulled. And, you know, if you think about it, that is the meaning of the cross, why is the cross so important? Because so many people just think of it as, you know, that's what gets people into heaven, and yet it's, there's so much more. We miss the glory of God's plan. We miss God's purpose if we limit the cross to just being salvation because, saints, the reason that God hates sin is that it doesn't just hurt you. It hurts all kinds of people. Have you figured that out? When we sin, when I sin, it doesn't just hurt me. It hurts my wife. It hurts my kids. It can hurt you. When, this, this whole thing, the, the cross is what pulls us out of this. All the sins that destroy people, that destroy families, that destroy towns, that destroy potential. God wants to, to pull those weeds out, to, to throw them in the fire, and that is what the cross is all about. God wanting to restore us to the beautiful creation that he designed for us to be, that he intended us, for us to be from the very beginning. I just want you to imagine for a moment what God sees. Can you try? The world as God created it to be, the future that he is preparing without pain or suffering or hatred or violence or envy or greed or lust or any of those things. A place where, where people are loved and being loved without being abused, without having their, their, their hearts or their lives broken by the actions of others or by their own weakness. Think about the new heaven and the new earth that, that God has designed to come at the end of days. You know, when we say thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the Lord's prayer, are we busy pursuing it? Because I want you to know if you are, that means you're a weed puller. You're actively looking for those things that would um, besmirch your witness your integrity as a Christian, and you're taking them out. And to be sure, we live in a broken world, I know that. And we can't expect things to be perfect on this side of eternity. But you know what? We can sure try. And God tells us to be holy as he is holy, to pull the weeds when you see them growing, pull them young. We've gotta make a start in that direction, and we do it by making our way to the foot of the cross where we kneel and we ask God to pull any of those weeds that are growing in our hearts. That's what I love about communion, because for like a minute or two, maybe more sometimes, when we come to the table, it's the first thing we do. We confess our sins, and then we claim that God's blood, Jesus' blood that he shed was enough to cover that sin for all time. And because of that, for that moment, I'm perfect. You're perfect without sin, on the authority of God's word. And in that moment, we are in true communion with Christ. So you know which weeds are choking your spirit, which weeds are holding you back. Give them to the Lord this morning as we go into a time of confession here. Let's just bow. Father God, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Master Gardener in our lives, put our lives in perfect order again.